who is using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on a daily basis? Cool, a lot of people. Okay, who is having some kind of uh, really well-tuned uh, text editor or IDE? Great, so it's really funny how we invest, we invest a lot of time in our IDEs or uh, our text editors to make them as productive as possible, but we don't really invest a lot of time in uh, researching how the Google DevTools and the Google Chrome DevTools work. So, uh, Chris Panayotova is here to tell us more about uh, how powerful is the Chromium DevTool and how we should use it. Please welcome her. Hi guys, uh, real pleasure to be here in front of you. Great introduction, I couldn't have put it better. <laughs> so, um, today I'm gonna talk about Google Chrome DevTools. And to be honest, I can sit here in front of you, speak for more than four hours. But unfortunately, I don't have that time. So what I'm going to try to do is just give you a short overview of the, the things that I have found mostly uh, useful as a front-end developer. So I'll start this lecture as I start every single day of my work day by opening local host. And I want to give you a quick history, just to break the ice, of what the development tools used to be. So back in the days, we did have your source. We still have it. But as you can see, and maybe some of you remember, you cannot interact with it. So it's not that useful. And if you have some kind of client code, like JavaScript, which is rendering in your DOM, you don't have any clean markup. So you just see what your server gives you. And we did have the alert method, but um, I was doing some mobile web uh, development around 2008, and I was really trying hard to debug with the alert. I didn't have any console log because we didn't have a console. So um, what's the downfall of the alert method is that non-primitives -primitive gives you meaningless output. So uh, if you can see here, I have this beautiful alert with complex object, but it will just give me object object. So this didn't work out. And some smart people around 2008 made the first development tool, which was called Firebug. And it was an add-on for Firefox. And maybe a lot of you guys have used it. And why I have provided the screenshot is basically to show you that what it was then, back in 2008, and what we are dealing with today hasn't changed that much. We still have the DOM view. We still have the, the, the styles. Um, unfortunately, it was decommissioned, uh, I think, last year. But still, it was a real game changer, changer. Every single browser ever since has started competing in which one will make the best dev tools. And I think, in my personal view, that Chrome has far exceeded the expectations. So let me start with the Elements panel. What's really useful there? The Elements panel is what I have found out most developers deal with. So we, I'll open it over here. And yeah, we do have the DOM view, and we have the styles. And that's pretty much what I have noticed that people use mostly on their day-to-day -day lives. So, but did you know that we have the possibility to export and reuse our co core palettes? I'll show you a bootstrap template here. And I will inspect this header. And this is the node which is producing the header, and this is all the styles which are basically applied to this header. So uh, what I have found super nice is that the people from Google have given me this opportunity to add my own colors. But not, that's not all. If you click on this little box over here, you'll be given this beautif beautiful color palette where you can pick up any color on your page and just apply it. Moreover, we have this possibility to see the colors in different formats. If you click on those arrows over here, you'll be able to see hexadecimal, RGBA covers, and HSLA covers. But me, for example, I am a developer, and I'm not a designer, so it's really hard for me to pick up covers. And the, the good people from Google have thought for my case as well. They have given me a couple of palettes which I can work with. So here, in the last box, there are, again, two, two small arrows, which if you click, you'll be given four drawers. 
every time that you open the Chrome, it will gi give you the material UI. So if you're not a designer and you want to apply quick colors, you can just come, select the material palette, and by the way, if you, if you um, click hard, it will show you every single uh, color from light to dark. You also have custom colors, and CSS variables is also something that I have found super useful. Because it will scan all the CSS files that you have, and in case you have defined any CSS variables, it will show it to you. Uh, last but not least is the page colors. Page colors means that these are all the colors which are currently in your page. So what I use this mostly is r right before I go to production, I roam through all of my pages, I see what colors I'm applying and which I'm not, and I'm deleting everything that I'm not using. So that's for colors. Oh, by the way, when I was doing this presentation, I found out a new tool, which is super nice. Um, there is a shortcut here, which you can apply um, some, some, some stuff like, for example, box shadow. And one of them is add a color to your text. And if you come here and add a color, and you scroll, and you see this contrast ratio, which means that, again, for non-designers, it will give you the best colors which will be applied to the, the text uh, for this background and the worst ones. So in this case, if I select anything that's above this white line, it means that it won't show well with this purple. But if I select above the line, it will notify me that my contrast ratio is nice. So good to go. OK, um, HTML view, or the DOM view, also has a great context menu. You can. Uh, you can access this context menu by right-clicking on any of your notes. And this here, and I hope that you can see it, is the context menu. So what we are dealing with here is we can add an attribute. If, for example, we want a quick access to some of our classes, we can add a class attribute. We can edit an HTML, which is pretty self-explanatory. We can delete the element. And by the way, there is a quick trick here. If you press the H key on your keyboard, it will give you a class which will be the same as applying visibility hidden to your code. And pressing H again will toggle this class. You can force the element to be in any kind of pseudo state, which is um, super nice if you want to see the colors which are applied when you focus an element or when you hover over an element. So let me select this button, which is my example. I will open the context menu, and I will force the state to be the focused one. If I force it, I'll be given all the colors which are applied, all the styles which are applied to this element when the pseudo class is, fo is focused. And by the way, you can access the same menu from here, from the toggle element state. If you click it, it will give you all the options to be focused or, for example, when it's hovered. So this is all the colors which are applied to this button when it's covered. Great tool for debugging is the break on. So um, I have added this example of a button which is disappearing when I click on it. So this will make this button disappear. And if I don't know what's forcing this button to, dis to disappear, I can select on it, and then come here, context menu, break on, and I'll be given three options. I can break on subtree modifications, on attribute modifications, and on node removal. What subtree modifications means is that if this element has any children under it, if they are changed, the code which is causing them to change will be paused in the debugger. If the attribute modification is triggered, it means that, for example, a class is being changed, like the second button, which is changing constantly its class. And in this case, I have to break on node removal so I can see what's, what's going on. So if I come here and I add a breakpoint on node removal, and then I experience this element being removed, I'll be bring on to the source panel where the code which is exactly causing my button to disappear to show. And I want to quickly just go ahead in my lecture. This is something that uh, I should probably say in the sources panel, but still I'm here. Uh, I want to mention that this, for example, I'm using jQuery right now, and this will give us meaningless uh, output. So yes, the jQuery is modifying our element, but this is not our own code. So if you want to know where your own code is, you can just right-click on this file, which is making the modification, and, and you can black box the script. 
And if you black box the script, it means that any time that the script is in your call stack and it's causing any kind of change for debugging, for example, it won't be shown to you. So if I black box the script, this will bring me to the exact line of code which I am writing to cause this element to disappear. So yeah, this is something that I have found super useful, black boxing the script. Uh, and it's, it's really nice and, um, and smart. So it will show me in the call stack that there are four stack frames which are hidden, and this will be the script that I have just black boxed. So if I show it again, I can unblack box it. So stop black boxing will make me experience the same thing just, just to be paused here. Okay, and something else which I have found nice is when we're doing those applications which are adding elements when you scroll, and at some point you get lost. Where are, where are you? So if you go to the context menu and you click on any element which is not in your current view, and you, and you click on scroll into view, the Chrome will do its best to locate this element for you. Okay, so right-hand menu on the, other, on the other side is dealing with the styles which are applied to this element. And um, again, they're great for debugging. Uh, especially computed styles, I have found great on huge applications. If you have, found, if you have any um, bug which is related to styles, and you don't know what exactly style is trumping over other styles, which happens a lot when you have a lot of libraries. For example, you have a bootstrap and then you have your own styles which are trumping over it, and you don't know where this bug is coming from. You can always come to the computed styles, and you will be shown all the active styles for this current element. And if you don't know where some of those styles are coming from, you can click on this little arrow over here, and you'll be brought in styles to the exact line of code which is causing this change. Other thing that I have found super useful is the event listeners. This will give you all the event listeners which are currently on this page. And as opposed to the computed styles, this is better on smaller applications. So for example, if you're doing a React application, chances is that you have hundreds of event listeners here. And this might get confusing. But if, if you have a smaller application like I do here, uh, you can just see everything that currently applied to this page, and if you expand this, you will be shown the exact line of code which is causing, which is invoking this event. And if you are in doubt if this is breaking something or if this is um, this needs any attention from you, you can quickly remove the the event listener and see if that will fix things. We also have console drawer, which is available all over the place except from the console uh, tab, which is obvious because it's duplicating um, its functionality. And console drawer is opened by pressing the escape key. Escape key uh, will toggle uh, this view for you, uh, and it does have great um, it has great um, implementation with the elements panel, and. Even if you are not using jQuery, for example, in your web page, you'll be given all the jQuery selectors. So, dollar sign here, and if I want to select, for example, every single class which is wrapper in my website, I can just do dollar sign and then oops, wrapper, and I'll be giving the exact element which is with this class. And you can use that for quick coding. So if you don't want to go inside your JavaScript and write any kind of code, you can just, you can just access it like that. And there is also a reserved letter, a reserved word, which is dollar sign zero, which will give you the currently selected element in your elements panel. For example, if I select this history and I go ahead and I write dollar zero, it will give me the currently active element in my elements panel. And it's super smart because if you select another element and then also you want to see what you have currently selected, you should do dollar sign zero again. It will give you the, current, the, the new one. But if you do dollar sign one, it will show you the previously selected element. And that can be infinite. It can go to infinity. And last, um, this is my transition to the sources panel, is that the DevTools can be used as IDE. And I have... Um, added a little small asterisk here because, yes, you can use it, but for really small applications. So if you have any application which is dealing, dealing with post-processing, for example, Babel or CSS or SAS, 
it's not a good idea to use the ID as, uh, as a, I, uh, the DevTools as an ID. But if you have a small application, which is only HTML, CSS, JavaScript, go ahead. Uh, people from Chrome are, have promised to make a full-blown IDE of the DevTools, so hopefully in the future we'll be able to see more improvements on that topic. So if you want to use your application as IDE, you just have to go to the sources, and I'll clean, clean stuff up here. You have to open this navigator, and you'll be given this page and file system tabs. In the file systems, it will give you the opportunity to add a folder as a workspace. And you can use that by clicking here and adding your project, or you can just drag and drop it. So in this case, I'm just going to add it from projects. Up is my project here. And since it's getting a little bit cautious, because it will write to disk, it will give you this, inform this tab, and it will, it will ask you to allow it to make any changes that per persist to disk. So if I go and al I allow it, every single file from my project will be listed here, and I'll be able to ed edit it. And if we go back to the Elements panel, and I'll show you this example here, in the styles, now our styles will have this little green dot over here, which says that whatever I make as a change will persist to disk. So if, for example, I change the background to this yellow, and I refresh my page, then this change will be persisted. But again, I wanted to, uh, to tell you that I'm using SAS here. So obviously, when I make any kind of change in my SAS and I compile it, this change will be forgotten. So if you have my case, you can go to the Sources panel and then select your exact file which is making the change. And then you will be given more or less the same, uh, the same opportunity to act uh, as you are in the Elements panel. So for example, if I go to this, to this class and I change my background to red or anything and I save it, it will trigger my post processor and my page will refresh without my, the need for me to refresh it as well. And if you want to remove this project, from your file system, you just go and remove, remove the project. OK, so moving on to Sources Panel, which is a really amazing tool for debugging. And um, again, um, a quick, um, quick tip. If you, if you hit Command P, it will give you a fuzzy search all over your documents. So I will just fire my example, because I want to show you how I usually use that for debugging. And people who are doing backend or uh, some kind of code which usually um, compiles, they are really used to doing debugging, but that wasn't the case in JavaScript for some time. So once, we, once upon a time, we did have the console log, and we are still using it quite a lot. But now we do have two more ways to debug our code. And one is by using this reserved word, which is called debugger. And the other way is just by applying a breakpoint in our code. And this is done by clicking any line of our, our code. This will give, you, give us a debugger. And any time that the JavaScript is uh, in this line of code, it will pause us for the dev tools. So what I wanted to, to share with you mostly are those buttons over here, which are the buttons which are doing the actual debugging for us. So we do have this button which is called step over a next function call, step into a next function call, step out of the function, at, and just step. And what each of them means is that if we click step over the next function call, it means that if we are given any function in our current place of code, which we are not interested in, in going into it, but it's, for example, evaluating some kind of value and we're assigning it to a variable, then it will do its job, assign, uh, assign the value to our variable, but we are not interested in going into there, so we're just keeping it. As opposed to stepping into next function call, it will bring us to every single function which is currently in our way. So this means that if I click and in step into next function call, I'll go to 11 and then I'll go to 13, which is another function, and by clicking into it, I'll, go, I'll be bringing to function B, which is over here. And if I step out of this function, this is something that I have noticed that brings a little bit of confusion to developers, 
is that this is not a time traveling debugger. So basically, we will not be bringing them back to line 13, but we will go to line 14. And this is because of the nature of JavaScript. JavaScript is unidirectional, and this means that we cannot go back and forward in it. And step is uh, the last button, which means that if you really want to do some micromanagement on how JavaScript is being executed, then you just need to go to step. This will give you the way that it's doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about those drawers here because they are useful for us as well. And I'll fire my example again. And I'll go to function B. So something that I have noticed people do, and I have done it uh, in, in the past, is that whenever I want to walk a some kind of variable, I open the console drawer and I start to manually type number, for example, just to see what it holds in this particular moment. But you don't have to do that because now we have the watch drawer over here. And it means that any kind of expression that you are inputting here will be watched as long as it's in scope. So if I come to the plus sign and I want to watch for number, and as long as number is in scope, I'll be able to see what it holds. And, that's, and that doesn't work only for variables. It can also work for functions and for other expressions as well. So, for example, b in my case is a function. And I'll be able to see all kinds of information which is given to it. So, as long as my b, uh, as long as my number is into scope, I'll be able to see what's going on in it. And it will constantly change update values as long as it's in scope. So if I go out of this function, obviously B won't be available anymore, so I won't be able to see it. And what I use this for is when I do some fetches. Um, when I fetch any kind of information, I usually uh, assign it to a variable which is called response, and that's true for, for all over my applications. So I usually only watch for a response, and this means that I don't have to do any uh, breakpoints which I don't need. What I find super useful as well is the call stack. And what the call stack means is it's going to give you all the actions which are, has been triggered till the moment that you have post in debugger. So if I go to function C, for example, it will, it will tell me that a handwork has been triggered, which has triggered a function which is called dispatched. And this dispatch function has triggered a function which is called A. And A has triggered a function which is called C. So if I want to go back, Oh, this is as opposed to this debugger is a time traveling debugger. So if, it, if you get confused which function comes after which function, you can always just, just come and click on the function which has invoked the other one, and it will bring you to the place where the, this invocation has happened. Scope is also something that I have uh, found uh, nice, even though I don't use it that much because it does have a lot of noise. Uh, it will give you every variable that you have in scope, and it will also give you this connection to the global scope. So if you're wondering what you have in global, you can always come and check it out here. Breakpoints will give you all the breakpoints that you have in your code. So if I put um, a couple of breakpoints, I'll be able to see them. And if I don't need them anymore, but I still want to keep them in history, I can just deactivate them like that. If you want to delete them, just remove all the breakpoints. And before I go to XHR fetch breakpoints, which are super useful when you don't know where some kind of fetch is happening, I just want to show you uh, the conditional breakpoint, which is, again, something that I use quite heavily. So in this case, I will trigger this function E, which will be passed a variable of foo. And I want to be posting debugger anytime that this variable equals to something. So anytime that I have a condition which is met, I want to post it there. And you can do this by right-clicking and adding a conditional breakpoint. So if I, if I add a condition, for example, pause me here whenever foo is equal to the text, which is foo, and I press enter, and then I trigger my code, I'll be paused here because this condition has been met. But if, for example, I edit this breakpoint and foo is equal to bar, then pause me here, the condition is not met, so this breakpoint won't be fired. And I will remove this breakpoint here. And XHR breakpoints are super useful when you have a bug which is happening from a fetch somewhere in your code, but you don't exactly know where this fetch is, is, is going on. So in my example here, I'll be doing a fetch of 
an API every single second. And if I don't know why this is happening and where it's coming from, I can, also, I can come here in the XHR page breakpoints and I will give, you, give it a condition. Break whenever a new URL containing the word, for example, API is happening. So next time that I have this API um, going on, I'll be, I'll be brought to the exact line of code which is doing this XHR fetch. And yeah, as I told you, great for debugging. Used it a lot of times. OK, so this is for debugging com complex applications. And next panel, which is, which is super useful, and probably more of the backend developers are um, familiar with, is the network panel. So um, this will be invoked on every single page that you have. And it will, it will give you, oops, sorry. It will give you those two tabs. And both of them are called the waterfall. And what the waterfall means is that it will, it will give you every single resource which has been fetched in this particular page. The first one will be the time frame of how your resources has been fetched as opposed to the second one, where you will be given of some valuable information about each resource. You'll be given its name, its status, if it has fetched fine or not. It will give you the type. It will give you the place where it has been invoked, who has initiated this document. And it will give you the size. And size can be a little bit tricky because it gives you two numbers. And the first number means that this is the actual size of the document. And the second number will give you the cached size of this document. So if you're experiencing any problems with the networking, if your resources are fetching too, too, too slow, it might be a good idea to come here and check the sizes. If they are too much um, the same, then you might be um, experiencing, um, you might want to, to see if uh, your server can serve some gzipped files. And here again, we have the waterfall. And it will also give you some super valuable information about why these resources have been acting as they are. And this is more meaningful for backend developers, and I won't go into details what every single coward does. But again, if you are experiencing any type of problems with the networking, then it might be a good idea to come and check uh, what, how the resources have been served. And uh, I want also to show you something in the network, um, which is uh, great for optimization. And this is a uh, micro optimization. Basically, I have uh, given here a couple of notes. And I won't read all of them. But big companies like Apple and Google, for example, they have made a marketing research that every sing single second of delay of their pages results in huge losses of money. For example, the BBC ha has seen a loss of 10% of their users for every second of page load. So if your PM project manager comes to you and, and asks you to make sure why your site is loading so, so bad, uh, it's a good, good place to look in the network tab, tab. And I want to show you how YouTube has, uh, has coped with the problem because they have done everything by the book. So if you want to see how your networking is performing, you should inspect the, the website, and you sh it's best if you, um, if you inspect it into a separate window, because this way you'll be able to see the whole website. And if we go to the network panel, and then we click on this capture screenshot, this would, th this would mean that we will be given a screenshot every single time that a meaningful paint has happened. So hitting a screen, uh, uh, capture a screenshot and going back to the website, and loading it with a hard reload, which you can do by, the, by right clicking here on the, on the refresh, and then um, empty cache and hard reload. Every single time that the paint has happened will be saved here in those screenshots. So if we open here, we can see that, first of all, uh, YouTube has given us its logo. It has given its uh, placeholders for the images. And then some API has fired, for example. Some images has come. Some text has come. And why they do that? They do that because they don't want their website to be, to be going up and back uh, whenever a person is hitting them with a bad connection and a bad CPU. 
So we as developers, we're obliged to give good performance to people who don't have the resources that we, we have currently. And if we want to do that, we can do it here in the network tab. Okay, I'll move on to, to audits, which as opposed to networking can give us some higher level of auditing of our website. So, audits here will give us the tool which Google has been building for quite some time, which was called Lighthouse. And we do have other uh, resources in the, in the wild web uh, where we can see any kind of, uh, um, of, the, of um, site auditing. But this works better only because uh, it can work also on localhost. So if you go to any kind of other um, resources in the web, uh, you have to be in production. So if you want to audit your localhost, you can always come here in audits. And it will ask you to give it a couple of, um, of settings. So first of all, it will ask you what kind of device do you want to audit your website on. And then it will ask you what kind of audits you want to perform. So unless you're doing a progressive web app, it might not be a good idea to audit for progressive web app because it's, uh, it needs some other kinds of development. But it's a good idea to see performance, best practices, accessibility, and CEO. And accessibility is kind of a gray area because if you're building an internal website, then probably you don't need it. But if you want to be ranked higher in Google, then you do need accessibility um, features on for your website. And it will also give you this throttling option, which uh, will, will uh, artificially simulate a, fast, uh, a slower internet and a worse machine than yours. Because we as developers, we're really blessed. We have nice connection. We have nice computers. But usually people around the world, which is our clients, they don't. So in this case, um, for the example which I will show, I will simulate a fast 3G and a four times CPU slowdown. And again, as uh, networking, this is best done in a separate place. So I will run audits, and while audits are running, it will constantly update the page which I am auditing. And it will um, run some tests on it. So this, is, this has been done. And what information that I have here is that my performance on the website is really nice, which is not that impressive because I also only have some text on, on, on a page. And then it will tell me that my accessibility is not good enough. I have done some best practices, and my CEO can do some rework. So first of all, it will give me some metrics on performance. I was speaking about this in networking. First, first meaningful paint, uh, first um, um, time to be interactive. So this means that the first time when your user can uh, click on a link or click on a button, this is the first time to be interactive something that's also measured by Google when they're ranking your website. It will give you these uh, screenshots, as it did in networking, and it will also show you some opportunities that you have missed to, be a better, to, to have better websites. So, for example, in my case, I can eliminate render blocking resources, I can properly size my images, or, so, or remove some unused CSS. It will also give me what I have done uh, right, so it will give me a list of the post audits that I had. Accessibility is not something that I did well with, but again, and this applies to progressive web app if you are trying to do one, this is a good place to start. Just come, uh, come to audits and then test for accessibility, test for progressive web app. It will give you this list of really meaningful things that you can do to improve your user's performance. Uh, uh, to, to improve your users' um, expectations to your websites. So again, uh, in this case, I haven't uh, used attributes correctly, and my elements have some discernible names. Uh, and again, it will give me some audits which I have post. Uh, it will show me every best practice which I have done. It will give me some list of CEO optimizations that I can do so I can rank higher. And it will also show me um, what kind of settings were used when this audit was done. And this is for audits. Uh, I wanted to continue with performance and memory, but unfortunately I won't have any time to do that. Performance is really great if you want to do some CPU optimization and um, 
and memory is great if you have uh, some memory leaks on your website. So if you're interested in those topics, I would gladly share them with you. I'll hang around here uh, in, this, um, in the area. And if you're interested, come and meet me and we can talk about this. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I just got three times more productive in my daily work, so that was great. We have time for a couple of questions. Someone? Question? Come on, don't be shy. Rado? All right. So, uh, what happens if you're using, for example, something that's not pure JavaScript, but a framework like React or Angular, or even if you're using Angular, which is TypeScript, and it's, the JavaScript is compiled? Well, usually what you have to do is you have to enable mapping. So this will uh, enable the Chrome DevTools to go to the exact code which you're doing before post-processing. So this is what you have to do. You can do that with Webpack, with Grunt, Gulp, whatever you're using. Cool, one more question. And how you test uh, for mobile devices right there in the home tools? Oh yeah, this is something that I didn't actually show. But if you want to test for mobile devices, you can again come here in, uh, in the dev tools. And then there's this little button. Oof. This is not useful. There is this little button which uh, will toggle the device toolbar and if you click it here, you'll be given this responsive layout where you can choose any kind of device which is here on this list or you can choose other uh, devices from the emulated devices. And by the way, it's, it's super uh, smart because when you emulate on any kind of mobile device, it will also send the headers for this device. So if, for example, your application in production is taking the user to another experience, which is a mobile experience, it will trigger that, uh, that re reward for, for your application. And we have time for one more question. Do we have one more question? Nope. Okay. Thank you, Chris. It was awesome.